Yesterday we reached the end of Genesis chapter 1. We began to talk a little bit about critical theories of the authorship of Genesis. And the only reason we talked about that was because there is a difference in perspective between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which has caused many critics to assume that the two chapters come from two different sources written by two different authors. Normally, four different authors or four different editors are imagined. In English, they're called the J, the E, the D, and the P. And all those letters represent different points of view, different emphases in composition. Well, the obvious thing I'd like to point out is that Genesis 2 is not a different account of creation. Genesis 2 is an elaboration or a concentration on the most important aspect of creation, that is the human creation. In Genesis 1, we're told about the creation of the cosmos, literally everything in Hashemayim Waha Eretz, the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 2, the focus of Revelation zeroes in on humanity, the first human pair, and the nursery which God had prepared for them called Eden. Remember that God is a father. He's always been a father. He was a father before there ever was a world because there was a son before there ever was a world. God the second person. And if you've ever been a father or a mother or if you ever become a father and a mother or a mother, you will have that wonderful expectation of the baby's arrival. Well, what do you do before the baby arrives? Well, you prepare the baby's room. You, you prepare your house to receive uh, a child. And so this is a loving account of God preparing a place for his children to live and to grow and to prosper. Uh, by the beginning of chapter 2, we are told that uh, God finished his work of creation on the seventh day. If you read it carefully, it, 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 it doesn't say that he finished on the sixth day and, and rested on the seventh day. It says that he finished on the seventh day and then he rested, um, which is a little bit surprising because we don't usually think of it like that. But that's actually um, um, what is suggested in chapter 2, verse 2. And there was a special blessing given to the seventh day in verse 3. Christians argue about uh, days of rest. Um, let me just say that the Sabbath is not a part of the law only, which is given by Moses. Christians argue about which part of the law we're under, if we're under any of it as believers, or if we're under its moral aspects. But I just want to mention here that the, the, the principle of Sabbath rest is a creation reality. It's something built into everything from the beginning, and it's a pattern and a model which God Himself practiced. So um, I also think it's a picture of the way we approach our salvation, that we're not, first physically, we're not productive by working all the time. We're only productive if we rest some and also work. And spiritually, we're not productive by our works. We're productive by our rest, by resting on Jesus and the work of another. So it's a picture of that salvation and spiritual reality as well. But we have here from the very beginning uh, a, a picture of a Sabbath rest. Just noting as we leave chapter 1 um, that it says that God looked at everything that He made and it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. And that's the way chapter 1 ends. By the way, I, I have to mention this to you. Some of our best scholars don't like dividing 
the six days into two groups of three and teaching it like I taught it yesterday. As a matter of fact, they say that the fish don't fit. The fish and the sea do not fit in that pattern. Well, I don't know if Moses intended to, to write it that way. I don't know if this is what the Holy Spirit was trying to get across, that God was addressing the tohu, the formlessness, the bohu, the emptiness in the two pairs of days, the first three days and the last three days. All I know is that it helps me remember what happened on each day to look at it that way. So I'm not saying that's gospel and you have to think of the first six days of creation the way I thought it yesterday, but it helps me remember what happened on each day to think of it through that pattern. Now, uh, we are told in verse 4 of chapter 2 that this is the account of the heavens and the earth. There's an important Hebrew word in verse 4 called uh, toledot, which is repeated several times in Genesis. We'll see it again, for instance, in, in chapter 5. These are the records or the histories of, of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now, um, we talked a little bit yesterday about um, the claims of science which apparently contradict the record of Scripture. And I share with you my own approach to that kind of thing. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more today as we talk about the special creation of man. And I will share some challenges which need to be asked to scientists. And we need, we need good answers for those questions. But I will say that in verse 4, there's another argument against the idea of a day like we, cre like we imagine a day. Notice what Genesis 2, 4 says. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day. Same Hebrew word is used that's used in the six created day, creative days. The Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M. Um, in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Here's the argument. In chapter 1, it does say six days, but in chapter 2, it says in the day. Therefore, there's some elasticity in the concept. We can stretch it. It covers more ground conceptually than just our normal idea of a 24-hour day. Well, let me just say that's an argument. It's an argument like the gap theory, that something happens in terms of the angelic rebellion and Lucifer leading a certain number of angels against God between chapter 1, verse 1 and chapter 1, verse 2. It is one argument that can be offered to suggest that Scripture allows for much more time in creation than we normally think of. And I admit it's an argument. It's a pretty good argument. It may even be a true argument. I just don't believe it. Um, I think that all it means in verse 4 is this is a Hebrew way of saying in the time or at the time when God created everything. I don't think it's really a powerful or a legitimate thing to s insist that the fact that day is used this way in, in chapter 2, verse 4, means that we don't think of real days in chapter 1. If for no other reason, then the days in chapter 1 have an evening and a morning. And that makes the argument in chapter 2, from chapter 2, verse 4, a little bit weaker, I think. Okay, now... We are going to take some time on chapter 2, but we're not going to look as, in as many verses in these chapters as we did in chapter 1, or we'll be sitting here on Friday and we will not have gotten to chapter 10. So we will, we will go a little faster. Uh, in verse 10, Eden is located in terms of geography. By the way, the word Eden means delight. And... Um, it also suggests the idea of a boundary. God um, fenced off a certain area of His creation in a special way to put the first human pair there to live. And we've got four rivers mentioned, and um, we know where two of those rivers are from verse 14. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, I was next to these rivers about six weeks ago in Iraq. 
And, um, but, but I want to say this. This is a geographical description before the flood. Is it possible that the Garden of Eden was near what we in the West call the cradle of civilization between the Tigris and Euphrates River? Yes, that's possible. Is it probable? It may even be probable. But is it definite? No, it's not definite. Because these are geographical markers before the flood. It's unreasonable to assume that rivers ran in the same place after the flood as they ran before the flood. But these names are highly suggestive, and we do have um, an indication of, at least in today's terms, of, of where the Garden of Eden may have been generally. Now, something um, very important begins to happen in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. One thing we need to notice there is that work is something which existed before the fall. I don't know how it is in your country, but in my country, many people have the notion that the curse as a result of sin and the fall is work. It's not. Work is a good thing. And work was built into the original creation. We'll talk about how the fall affected work when we get to chapter 3 and what makes work so difficult now. But to have a vocation, to have an assignment from God, to have something to do is a wonderful thing. And it is a God-like thing because God Himself worked on those six um, first days, creation days. So before the fall, God gives man a job. Uh, he puts him in the garden to cultivate it. And He also gives him uh, a, a measure of freedom, verse 16. From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now, uh, we got to talk about this for a little while. Um, God is not only a creator, but God is a lawgiver. And God gives a moral assignment. The freedom is not absolute. The freedom is not unbounded. The freedom has a certain boundary to it, a certain restriction. Now, I need to talk about some spiritual principles right, right now. And I, I need for us to, I want us to, the book of Genesis to help us understand the spiritual reality that we live in and, this, and the way things have changed since the fall. Um, probably, in my opinion, the second most important thing to understand from the Old Testament is found in Genesis 2 and 3. Now, I have to tell you that I'm not the authority, and nobody said, Ronnie, we want you to decide what the most important thing and the second most important thing is in the, New Test in the Old Testament. I actually think that most Christians would agree about what the most important thing is for us to learn from the Old Testament. The most important thing to understand from the Old Testament is that it all points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And I think that most Christians would agree with that. Now, the second most important thing to learn from the Old Testament, I, there we have a lot of division and a lot of different nominations about what was the second most important thing. I'm going to tell you what I believe is the second most important thing to learn from the Old Testament. Adam and Eve did not eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge because they were hungry. That's very important to understand. They weren't hungry. They did not have a need because they could eat from any tree of the garden. And we're going to talk about why they did eat from the tree of knowledge in a little while. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now here's a warning about something that no one has ever heard of in verse 17. If you eat from the fruit hanging on that one tree, you will die. 
But here's the question. When that warning was originally given to Adam, and when he shared it with his wife, here's the question. What's death? Nobody's ever seen death. There wasn't any death in the universe. Everything in the original creation combined for the life and health of the man and woman. The elements of nature were for the comfort of man. The beasts of the field, the insects, the microorganisms were for the comfort of man. They could not kill man. They could not hurt man as long he was, as he was obedient to God. There was only one restriction. Now, no one had ever heard of death. No one had ever seen death. No one could even imagine death because death was only in one place. Death was in God's Word. Death was in God's warning. But they had to trust God that death was a thing to be avoided. Now, you and I are born into a radically, radically different world. We are born in a world where no one's ever seen life after death, at least not in our generation. We're born in a world where we've never met anybody who's come back from the dead, where no one who's lived in this century or the century before or the century before has brought a credible report of life after death, especially the kind of life where you don't die again. I realize there are reports of resuscitations and people believe that they've died and come back. I'm not going to take time to give you my opinion of those reports. But the reality is the 100% experience of every person is death. 100% of every generation dies. There is now no living survivor who fought in World War I. When I was a child, there were many. There are no more. 25 years from now, there will be no survivors from World War II, which is a, an incredible thing to imagine. If war does not kill a person, time will kill a person. 100% of every generation dies. Where is life after death? It's only in one place. It's in a promise of God. In the original situation, life was everywhere and death was nowhere except in a warning. In our situation, death is everywhere and life is nowhere, it, that is eternal life, except in a promise. Now the warning was ignored. The only way you can experience death is by partaking of that one fruit on that one tree. The warning was ignored and now death is everywhere. But now we have a promise and the promise is that if we will partake of the benefit of that one man who hung on that one tree, the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have eternal life. You see how the situations are exactly reversed, but the spiritual principle is the same. The Word of God must be believed for that which we cannot see. They could not see death in life. We cannot see life after death. But the reality is there. Now when we get to chapter 3, we will talk about how the warning of chapter 2 verse 17 is literally fulfilled. But here all we see is the warning. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. The tense of the Hebrew word is reflected this way. What God is saying is in the day that you eat, in the moment you eat from that fruit, dying you shall die. That's an accurate rendering of the Hebrew tenses. Dying you shall die. 